Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Two-Headed Tasmanians, Our Past, Your Future, an exciting uh, addition to our Island of Ideas public lecture series. As a reflection of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutruwita, Tasmania, the Muanina and Palawa people. The Palawa are the original and traditional custodians of the land from which we're broadcasting today in Nipaluna Hobart. We pay our deepest respects to elders past, present and emerging, and those who did not make elder status. We acknowledge the deep history of storytelling, knowledge sharing, and caring for land. And we recognize a history of truth and the impacts of invasion and colonization upon Aboriginal people, resulting in the forcible removal of their lands. If you're joining us on, on, online tonight, as I know many of you are, uh, not the ones in front of my face right here, obviously, uh, please feel free to share your acknowledgement by typing it into our Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. I'm Sarah Goldstone. I'm the Program Manager Public Events at the University of Tasmania, and I have the joy of working with amazing people like our speaker tonight to bring this series to you. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, today, we are broadcasting across Australia and the world. But for those of you who are in the room with me today, please take a moment to switch off your devices or on silent, whichever makes you happy, uh, to make sure our speaker is uninterrupted this evening. In the event of an emergency, please follow our event staff uh, out the door or, or out of the nearest exit, uh, down onto Dobson Road uh, at the grassy area between Dobson Road and Churchill Avenue. For our lucky online viewers, please note that your microphone, camera, and chat functions have all been disabled to protect your privacy while we're broadcasting live this evening. We do encourage both online uh, and in-person participants to ask questions, but for the online viewers, you can do this at any time using the Q&A function at the bottom of your window there. Uh, we'll address those at the end of the session, uh, and I'll, I'll ask Kristen your questions on your behalf. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access on YouTube and SoundCloud. We'll supply the details at the end of this session. On behalf of the University of Tasmania, I would like to express a really warm welcome to you all for tonight's session, Two-Headed Tasmanians, Our Past, Your Future. The Island of Ideas series began in 2020 as a way of connecting our community to ideas while we were unable to host public events. The online program continues in 2022 with the hope that we can connect Tasmanians, uh, community and research to, people's, to people across our regions and into a global network of ideas and emerging issues. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, uh, forums, seminars and workshops to nurture the ongoing learning of students, alumni and the wider public. These conversations are important to us. Connection and collegiality and community date back to our very founding. So tonight's talk I'm particularly excited about. Um, it has the potential to make significant positive change in the Tasmanian health and educational landscape. Old myths and fictional tales can sometimes signal more serious subjects and I think this is indeed the case for tonight's topic. Our speaker tonight will not only debunk the myths about two-headed Tasmanians that perhaps some of us have become worried about, uh, but will also outline how our unique island has created challenges in the Tasmanian diet and how we might make small changes in our lives to make a big difference for our future generations. Dr. Hines is a research fellow with the University of Tasmania's Menzies Institute for Medical Research, and has spent much of her career looking at iodine deficiency and the health implications it has held on our state, a condition that has direct links to the taunt about Tasmanians having two heads. She has extensive experience 
in the conduct of community-based research projects, having developed, managed, and reported on a wide range of studies from several different health themes, including cardiovascular disease, musculoskeletal conditions, and environmental health. It is her goal that research on iodine deficiency lead to the complete elimination of this preventable condition and, is, and its associated adverse outcomes in the Tasmanian population. This goal brings us all together tonight. Please join me and welcome to the floor for tonight's session, Two-Headed Tasmanians, Our Past, Your Future, Dr. Kristen Hines. Thank you, Sarah, for that generous introduction. And thank you, everybody, into the room for um, braving the wet, cold weather um, and coming out tonight. And hello to everybody online, you sensible people who've managed to stay home where it's nice and warm. I'm thinking we should have had some little tables set up here and maybe we could have had a glass of wine as we went through, because <laughs> I'm sure that people online are probably doing that right now. Look, it's great to have this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Those of you that know me well will know that I could talk about iodine, iodine nutrition, iodine deficiency, iodine deficiency disorders, and why iodine is so important for hours. But thankfully for you, I've only got half an hour. Okay, but I do hope by the end of this talk that I will have convinced some of you, and hopefully all of you, that the work that I'm involved in is a very important public health and education issue for Tasmania. And perhaps some of you may even wish to join us in our current work to help eliminate this preventable problem for all Tasmanians. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Ngunnawinna people of Litruwita, a people with a deep connection to the land and sea. And I hope during my talk, you will see that we have much to learn from the traditional owners of this place. Now, before we go any further, you may have noticed that if you came into the room, you've been given a crossword puzzle. And there's also a QR code that you can scan. And I believe the people online have got something in the chat that they can scan. So hopefully you're here because you want to be but it may be that there are some people that have been dragged along tonight. Perhaps it was your partner's turn to choose where you went for date night, or maybe mum said it was a good idea, you might learn something. So this is especially for you. So you can legitimately put your eyes down and fill in the crossword, get your phone out and do it on there. I won't be offended. <laughs> okay. So, but I'm more than happy for everybody to play along. You might actually know all the answers. But if not, this is going to be a little bit like the new Sticks and Specs game where Adam Hills um, gives hints throughout the program about the name of the song, if you've seen the new series recently. Okay. Now, because I've been doing this for so long, I actually sometimes forget that maybe a little bit of background information about iodine can be helpful. So what is iodine? Well, if you remember back to chemistry class, you might recall the periodic table and hearing about iodine that way. Now, you might have even done some pretty cool experiments with iodine in chemistry class. And if not, I can highly recommend going to YouTube and looking up the Mr. Hacker um, pages there. He does some amazing things with iodine. So just for interest afterwards. Anyway, I'm digressing. So iodine is a chemical element and it comes in various forms. The one important thing that I'd like you to actually remember is that the distribution of um, iodine in seawater is fairly constant, and this is something that can work for us. However, in, sea, in freshwater and on land, it's actually highly variable. So Tasmania is classified as a region of endemic iodine deficient, deficiency because of the lack of iodine in many of the soils here. Okay, for those of you who fell asleep in chemistry class, you might be more familiar with iodine as an antiseptic. In my family, we knew that you would really hurt yourself if mum came out with the betadine and the band-aids. So similar to these advertisements, it was usually my brother that mum was attending to. But iodine is actually a really amazing element. It's got so many uses, and I've just listed a few here tonight. If you've ever had a contrast X-ray or a CT scan, it's likely that iodine was actually the contrast dye that was used. It's also used as a disinfectant and an antiseptic in a lot of medical procedures. And it's also the basis of anti-radiation pills, which are used in the event of a nuclear accident. So potassium iodide tablets help to flood the thyroid gland with iodine and reduce the uptake of radioactive iodine in, when there's nuclear fallout. 
So despite Putin's ongoing threats, I'm hoping that none of us are going to have to use this form of iodine anytime soon. So you may not be aware, but iodine is actually an important component of things that we do every day. It has a huge range of applications. I've just listed a few of them here. Um, iodine used in, is used in making nylon to um, create heat resistance in things like tires. It's also used as a food coloring. So if you buy those maraschino cherries in the supermarket, they're not actually, that's not actually the natural color. I'm sure you probably all knew that. It's actually an iodine based dye that gives it that color. And I've been informed that um, iodine is essential if you've got a meth lab, which apparently is the most highly used drug in Australia, according to measurements in the water that came out today. <laughs> So frankly, I think it's easier to get paint if you want to have your spare room look purple, but each to their own. So iodine is a basically essential for life for a whole range of animals, including us. Without iodine, tadpoles wouldn't turn into frogs. It's crucial for the inhibition of neuronal activity, which is associated with hibernation in mammals. It leads to a drop in body temperature and a slowing down of the metabolism. Now, I'm sensing a little bit of agitation from the audience. I'm not sure if it's because I'm not dropping enough hints about the crossword and you're struggling to fill it in, or whether you're all waiting for me to explain what on earth has iodine got to do with the two-headed Tasmanian myth. Hopefully, all the people online are still with me. So can I get a show of hands, maybe in the audience, and I think you can put your hand up online, how many of us are Tasmanians? Oh, there's a few of us. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay. How much do we hate this taunt? It really is ridiculous. I must have to say, for the most time that I've been working in this field, I have avoided using the term two-headed Tasmanians. I find it quite offensive, and I'm sure some of you do as well. But we live in this new age of clickbait. And I thought, well, maybe I can use this to my advantage, help get the message out there about the importance of iodine. But is it really clickbait, though? It certainly seems to have gotten a few more people here than the last talk I gave, so that's good. It seems to have worked as far as that goes, but it may have actually have had more to do with Sarah's brilliant marketing, I think, <laughs> to get everybody along tonight. <laughs> So is there any evidence for this myth about Tasmanians? As scientists, we actually want to provide people with evidence. But how do we go about this? Oh, I'm not going to touch the screen again. <laughs> um, I have learned one thing from the pandemic, and that is that anybody can be a scientist or an epidemiologist. You just have to do your research. So how do you do that? Well, apparently you use Google. So my Google search led me to the east coast of Tasmania and a Facebook page with a shop called Two-Headed Treasures. I kid you not. Well, I'm not convinced that Ted, Tassie Ted, as he is called, is great evidence of the two-headed Tasmanian myth. I must say, I was beginning to feel a bit out of my depth with this whole Google research thing, so I actually engaged the help of some other people from um, UTAS. You know, a bit of collaboration is always a good thing. So thanks to Trudy Brown, who's a UTAS employee, she found some evidence of two-headed Tasmanians on the northwest coast. Yep, you can feed your kids some rather radioactive-looking two-headed biscuits. They're available at the Somerset Bakery, although getting there might be a little bit tricky at the moment, given the um, situation with the Cam River Bridge, if you live east of it. Now, you might also need some of those potassium iodide pills that I spoke to you about earlier, so you don't start glowing in the dark if you're going to consume these ones. So I'm still not convinced that we've got any scientific, good scientific evidence here for this myth. So I think it's time to look in southern Tasmania, where we are at the moment. OK, so things are not much better here. For more two-headed biscuits, slightly more upmarket because they're made of gingerbread and they look a little bit more edible than the other ones. So Google might not be the best option. I think I'm going to just return 
to the science that we know and the methods that we use. It might be a bit, bit of a better way to go than doing your own research. All right. I think we have found out, however, that Tasmanians have got a really great sense, good sense of humour. So I might as well ask that joke that's up on the screen. How do you tell if someone's Tasmanian? Is anybody brave enough to answer that question? Star. You've got a scar. Brilliant. Well, you must be Tasmanian. <laughs> We've all heard this one too, haven't we? Look for the scar on their neck. Well, perhaps we're actually getting a little bit closer to the truth. But before we look at this, I think it's important for all Tasmanians in the audience with a sense of humour to know that you can get your own cookie cutter and you can make some gingerbread to share with your mainland friends. I think it's time we definitely embraced this myth. All jokes aside, though, there is actually a serious side to this two-headed myth. About 30 years after the colonisation of Tasmania, Tasmania by Europeans, medical records began to report neck swellings known as goiters. Some little clues popping up now, so you might want to you know, have a look at your crossword as we go along. From about 1830 through to the 1950s, goiters were a common occurrence across Tasmania. Left untreated, goiters could become so large that they did actually look as if the person had two heads. And surgical treatment to remove the enlarged tissue would leave people with a massive scar across their necks. So there is some evidence for this myth. We now know that this swelling is due to enlargement of the thyroid gland, resulting from insufficient iodine in the diet. So our research here at the university, in collaboration with people in the health department, has focused on the role of iodine as an essential micronutrient for the human body. But why is it so important for our bodies? Iodine is essential for the synthesis of thyroid hormones, which are made by the thyroid gland, which sits over the trachea. It's that butterfly-shaped gland. Thyroid hormones are basically essential for life. They're involved in so many biological processes with the blood taking those hormones to most organs in the body. Insufficient iodine, however, can lead to a number of adverse outcomes which we call iodine deficiency disorders. So historically across the world, there's been evidence for the impact of poor iodine nutrition for centuries. Prior to COVID, I was actually lucky enough to travel to Europe just months before the borders closed. And while my family do not share the same level of enthusiasm for Renaissance art that I had, I had an amazing time looking for depictions of iodine deficiency. So you can see up on the screen in the first picture, that's actually a self-portrait of the artist and you can see the massive goiter on her neck. The second, screen, second um, picture on the screen is Raffaello's last work, The Transfiguration of Christ, which depicts a possessed child supposedly He's actually showing signs of what is medically known as cretinism, resulting from gestational iodine deficiency. Of course, these were all painted at the time when the relationship between the lack of dietary iodine and goiter and other disorders was not known. And we certainly didn't know about the gestational effects on the unborn child. Now, according to the World Health Organization, Iodine deficiency is the leading cause of preventable brain damage and mental impairment in the world. Much of this actually occurs during pregnancy and early childhood. And globally, about a third of the world's population are at risk of iodine deficiency. Now, this deficiency occurs along a spectrum from severe to mild. So in areas where it's severe, the impacts on the brain and other parts of the body are also severe. It can lead to congenital hypothyroidism, which historically has been called cretinism, a medical term which describes someone who has extreme mental and physical retardation. It also causes deafness, mutism, spasticity of the limbs, among other things. It's a pretty poor outcome. But as I said, iodine, Deficiency occurs along a spectrum, 
and the impact of mild deficiency, that word mild should not be taken lightly. The impacts are just as bad. They're just not as visible and as easily diagnosed. So as I mentioned, we've had evidence of iodine deficiency in the Tasmanian population since the 1930s. But it's really interesting to note the that the historical record here contains no indications that the indigenous population were impacted by iodine deficiency. They lived off the land, but they weren't impacted by it. There are no written accounts or depictions in colonial art of goiter or any other deficiency disorders. It's believed that this is due to a combination of things. During the winter, many communities lived by the sea and they included a range of seafoods in their diet. Seafoods are a good source of iodine because we know that the seawater contains a high consistent level. And the use of kelp water vessels throughout the year meant that when these tribes migrated inland, where the foods grown in the soil may have been poor in iodine, they were still drinking water that contained iodine as the iodine would leach out of those kelp baskets and keep them sufficient throughout the year. We can really learn a lot from looking at our traditional owners of the land and their culture. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the history of iodine deficiency in Tasmania from the 1950s onwards. By the 1950s, it was evident that Tasmania had a big problem. The importance of iodine in a diet for preventing goiter and other conditions was beginning to be understood here. The health department at the time introduced a number of initiatives to help rectify iodine deficiency. Now I'm sure there's some of you, and you, put, you can put up your hand and tell me about it in the questions if you like, who remember getting goiter tablets at school. And some of you may have even been responsible enough to be what was called a goiter monitor. And it was your job once a week to actually give the iodine, potassium iodine tablets out to every other student. These tablets were also given to other people who were at risk, and that includes um, pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. At the same time, the school milk program was started. Now, this was done for other reasons, to improve other aspects of nutrition. But it just so happens that milk is also a good source of iodine for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is that the mammary glands naturally concentrate iodine to give it to the offspring. I'll go into the other reason a little bit later. And importantly, at this time, the health department started monitoring the population so we could see what was actually going on. They monitored um, children through school surveys, and there were also surveys of adults done during this time. So goiter tablets actually led to some improvements in iodine status, but not enough. The program had a number of issues, unfortunately. I've heard stories that some children didn't like the bitter taste and they would toss them out. Other children loved them and would have too many. So it really wasn't evenly spread. And apparently they frequently ended up in ink wells because the iodine would actually color the ink a beautiful purple color. So another solution was needed. And this is where the first bread iodization program began. Now this is another lovely, typically Tasmanian story. The school medical officer who was in charge of the school surveys, Dr. Heather Gibson, was Dr. Heather Gibson. She was married to one of the Gibsons associated with Gibson's flour mills. They were the sole providers of flour in Tasmania for bread baking at the time. So to cut a longish story short, potassium iodate was used to replace, replace potassium bromate as a bread improver. So this was a way of getting iodine into the diet most people ate bread at that time. Unfortunately, despite some careful calculations of the amount of potassium iodate that would be needed to improve the iodine status of Tasmania, there was a huge increase in hyperthyroidism. Um, 
we ended up with what was called a thyrotoxicosis epidemic. Now, it was really confusing because a lot of work had gone into the modeling to work out what the appropriate amount was. So what on earth had gone wrong? This is a story about milk. This is the other thing I was going to tell you about. So at the same time that we started iodizing the bread, unbeknownst to the health department, the dairy industry had started using a new sanitizer which contained iodine. So these iodophores in this sanitizer were actually remaining in the milk. So they were used to wash out the milk fats, the tankers and for teat dipping. So quite a lot of the residue was getting into the milk and increasing the iodine level. So unfortunately, you can have too much of a good thing. So the combination of the iodine in the bread and the iodine in the milk was too much. Surveys were done and it was decided that we would go with the milk and stop the bread. An upper limit was placed on the milk to make sure that people weren't, weren't getting um, too much. So by the end of the 70s, it looked like we'd actually solved this problem once and for all. Okay, but we're solely reliant now on just one source. And it's an adventitious source. And yes, there was regulation around the upper limit, but there was no regulation around the lower limit. And what happened? The milk levels started to fall because there was another new sanitizer on the market that the dairy industry started using. So the level in milk overall started to decline. Now, despite quite a lot of evidence um, that iodine deficiency might be resurfacing during the 80s, we stopped doing the monitoring of the population. A dangerous thing to do. So the combination of these things meant we had no idea what was going on. It wasn't until the late 1990s that anything was done about this. Reports were coming into the Thyroid Advisory Committee, which had been set up in the late 60s in response to the thyrotoxicosis epidemic, that goiter, thyroid cancers, and other issues related to iodine deficiency had increased to concerning levels. Now, this is where I come into the story. I haven't been involved in any of this work up until this point. I started working at the Menzies Institute in 1996, and in my first couple of weeks there, I was asked to gather some urine samples from about 100 children to send off to be analysed for iodine. The results came back and they were shocking. I don't think the health department actually believed how bad they were and thought maybe we needed to do another sample, a bigger sample, and do it across the state. We'd only looked at a few children in the south of the state, so we did this. There was a little bit of improvement by including children from all over the state, but it was still indicative of mild iodine deficiency. So a few more surveys were done of children and pregnant women, and this confirmed the recurrence of iodine deficiency. Immediately, colleagues in the health department began looking for solutions. Again, bread was looked at as the vector for getting iodine back into the diets of Tasmanians. By the end of 20, um, 2001, a voluntary bread iodization program was established. Now, we had bakers across the state agree to replace the salt this time that they used in bread making with iodized salt. And I'll show you in a minute the outcomes of that initiative. But first, iodine deficiency is not just a problem for Tasmania. There was evidence also emerging from the mainland, especially in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, that iodine deficiency and the disorders were actually increasing. And a national survey confirmed this. Given the success of the voluntary program here, a decision was then made eight years later in 2009 to make fortification of bread with iodized salt mandatory. This happened across Australia and New Zealand as iodine deficiency had reoccurred there as well. So I'm just gonna digress from um, Tasmania just for a little bit. There were actually a range of um, 
solutions to iodine deficiency that were explored in Australia before bread fortification was chosen. I won't go into them all now, but I do want to mention the preferred method, um, which is recommended by the WHO. It's called universal salt iodization. So this is where all salt, not just salt in bread, but salt, table salt, and salt in all manufactured products is iodized. The Global ID Network has shown that universal salt iodization has improved nutrition. In 1993, there were an estimated 113 countries that had issues with iodine deficiency. By 2019, universal salt iodization had reduced this to only 19. It was very effective. There is a fantastic paper that came out at the end of 2019 showing that the global prevalence of clinical iodine deficiency disorders fell from 13.1% in the population to 3.2%. That's 720 million cases of iodine deficiency disorders that had been prevented by universal salt iodization. So universal salt iodization reduced iodine deficiency disorders across the globe by 75.9%. It's just been a massive program that's had great outcomes. So I've put up this really grainy photo to show you the impacts. If you look at the two shorter men in the middle, they are the two older brothers from this family of four brothers. They were born before the universal salt iodization program. They actually all work in a salt iodization factory. <laughs> the two older brothers were born after the program was introduced. I think the picture shows you what the impact can be. So back to Tasmania. Now, this is what happened with voluntary and then mandatory fortification. Again, a picture that really tells a success story. Using urinary iodine surveys of school-aged children, we do that as a proxy for the general population. You can see how things have changed over time. And since mandatory fortification, iodine levels in Tasmania are now considered to be stable and within the adequate range. But, there is always a but, unfortunately. The modelling work that was done this time to determine how much iodine should be added to the salt in bread indicated that not all the groups who were at risk of iodine deficiency would be covered. Care had to be taken to make sure that children, one of our at-risk groups, would not get too much by the addition of iodised salt to bread. This meant that women of childbearing age would still be at risk. Unfortunately, pregnancy and breastfeeding impose an extra load on women, and they can require up to 50% more iodine at these times to ensure that they have enough, not only for themselves, but also for their baby grow growing baby and infant. But you might be wondering why this is so important. Earlier, I told you about the effects of severe iodine deficiency. Now, we only have mild iodine deficiency here, but mild does not mean that it's not important. Our research has shown that even mild iodine de deficiency can have adverse outcomes. We were very fortunate that in the early 2000s, we had a group of pregnant mothers participate in an iodine study at the time prior to bread fortification. So although some of these women had adequate iodine nutrition, most of them did not. And we've now followed the offspring of this cohort of women and looked at a range of educational outcomes. One of these was NAPLAN, the National Assessment Program for Literacy and Numeracy. Now this is a series of tests of basic skills that we hope all children gain. Um, and it's conducted every year in years three, five, seven, and nine. Now, we were able to link the children from our mother's study with their NAPLAN data. 
And we found that the children born to mothers who had inadequate ID nutrition during their gestation had consistently worse outcomes than their peers whose mothers had adequate ID nutrition. This occurred in the literacy tests only, not in the numeracy tests. And there's a number of reasons that we think that is. So unfortunately, despite these children growing up in a time of iodine adequacy due to the fortification of bread, the gap between the groups, particularly in spelling, which I've shown here, did not close. So whatever is happening during gestation, it's very resistant to change, even when children grow up with adequate nutrition. So in recognition that women were unlikely to receive adequate nutrition from dietary sources alone, the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia made a recommendation in 2010 that all women who are pregnant or breastfeeding take a daily iodine supplement. And it's recommended that they take 150 micrograms to help them get up to what they need. It's also important that they, they also recommended that if you're planning pregnancy, you take an iodine supplement. Now, there are two reasons for this. Firstly, many women don't actually know they're pregnant until well into their first trimester. And we know that there are some, that some of the excuse me, some of the neurological damage that can occur when iodine is lacking happens very early in the first few weeks of pregnancy. Secondly, our research has shown that many women have inadequate iodine intake even when they're not pregnant. So we've done a survey of women of childbearing age who weren't pregnant and found that their levels were suboptimal. This means that their thyroid is not primed for pregnancy. And what can happen is that if there's not enough iodine intake prior to pregnancy, even if you start supplementing after you find out you're pregnant, you may not be able to maintain those iodine levels throughout pregnancy. So we've done a little bit more work to look at the impact of the NH and MRC recommendation. And as you can see, despite having this for more than a decade now, a lot of women are not taking supplemental iodine. They're not taking the right amount and some don't have it at all. And only 20% are starting before pregnancy. So what to do? Why is this message not getting through to the people who need to know? An opportunity arose to investigate the lived experience of women from some low income and rural areas in Tasmania through child and family learning centres. This was a collaboration again with the Department of Education and the Department of Health. We conducted a number of focus groups and explored barriers and enablers to supplement use. Here are some of the things that the women told us. They didn't know about iodine. They'd not been told to take iodine by their healthcare professionals, but they really wanted to know and indicated that they would have taken them if they'd been told by a trusted health professional. So someone like their GP, a pharmacist or a midwife. They also wanted to know if they could check if it was in the supplement that they were taking. And some actually raised concerns about the cost of supplements. Now, if you've taken pregnancy supplements, you know that they're quite expensive. There are a lot of supplements out there now that do contain iodine, but unfortunately, this is an unregulated industry. So some do contain the right amount, some don't contain the recommended amount, some have too much. I've heard stories of women who know about iodine thinking if they took a couple of different brands that they would get enough. But like I've said, having too much is not a good thing either. So a series of recommendations have come out as a result of this report. We're going to fix this problem. The first one centres around women wanting to hear about iodine supplementation and nutrition from a trusted source. This is the one we're working on currently. We already know from a couple of mainland studies and some work that we've already done here with pharmacists 
but those trusted sources are not well informed about iodine supplementation recommendations or iodine nutrition more generally. It, we've had a generation come through since that 2010 recommendation. They're not getting the information. We know that midwives are now trained, Tasmanian midwives are now trained through a Queensland university. Queensland doesn't have a problem with iodine nutrition. So our health care professionals are not getting the message, unfortunately. So our first step is going to be to better equip them with the information that they need so they can pass it on to the women. So to do this, we're in the process of establishing a stakeholder reference group. And I would love to have a great range of maternal health care providers from across Tasmania participate in this. So we as researchers and policy makers can understand firstly, what do you know, where the gaps are, and how you would best like to receive this information. So please email me if you're interested. It's up there on the screen. I'd love to hear from you. We're also about to launch a quick 10 to 15 minute online survey for GPs and midwives across the state to look into this in a bit more depth. As I said, we've already done this, completed this with pharmacy staff and we had some great outcomes. So please look out, look out for these little squares on social media or you might get an email and um, share them with your colleagues. Share them with people that you know who are working in maternal health care. So what can the rest of us do to avoid iodine deficiency? It's pretty simple, really. There's three main sources, good sources of iodine, and you just need to consume them regularly. First one is milk and dairy foods. The second one is bread fortified with iodized salt. Check the label on your bread, see if it says iodized salt, or ask your baker because there are some, some exemptions to this. You need to have a few serves of these every day. And try and include some seafood in your diet. We have the most amazing seafood in Tasmania, but unfortunately, we really do not eat much seafood here. But that can also help. It's a great source of iodine. I've dropped a few more hints there if you're trying to finish off your crossword before I finish up. I'm almost done. So the other thing you can do is share. Please share this information with others, particularly young women. I hope you agree with me that it is time that we put our heads together, whether you've got one or two, and eliminated iodine deficiency from Tasmania. Please, let us not have another generation of Tasmanian children fail to reach their full cognitive potential due to a lack of iodine. Before I finish up, I'd like to thank all the wonderful Tasmanians who have been participants in many of the research studies that we've done over the past now 25 to 30 years, but who's counting? <laughs> and to the research assistants that have helped conduct that research. Of course, I've not done this work alone. I've listed the four main people that have been involved in this. Judy, John and I have worked together for a long time and Ian and Peter have been particularly involved in the educational work. But there have been many others um, across a range of university departments and also the Department of Health and Education. So thank you to you all for your commitment to this work. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the funding bodies that help make this work possible. But of course, like most researchers, we're always looking for more donations and more funding so we can continue this important work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that extraordinary talk. For those of you who are joining us online, please feel free to ask Kristen, uh, Kristen your questions directly in the Q&A function. Um, and for those of you in the audience, we'll, we'll turn to a, a few questions uh, just after I've, I've uh, asked you about this question from an anonymous mm -hmm. online <laughs> attendee. Uh, their anonymous has said, so does all salt in processed food have iodine? No, not, not in Australia. Mm. In fact, if you read the labels, it will just say salt. Okay. And it's, it's not iodized because there is no requirement for that to happen. Okay. And it's a, huge, it's a huge thing to make that happen. Um, it would require relabeling of foods. Mm. It would require industry to change. And there's, it's, a, it's a bigger story. So we export a lot of our foods to other countries. Those countries don't want iodized salt in those processed foods you know, because they have enough already. 
That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any questions here? I've got a gentleman up here first. Ever since my high school teachers nicknamed me Doc Everett because they thought I looked like a junior version of that great man, um, I've been a political junkie of, of sorts, mainly through the Labor Party. I had 22 months in state parliament from May 2008 to March 2010. But anyway, my question is, what could, Kristen, could you tell, tell us what your researchers have done, what professional body you belong to has done? Um, do we do enough to give information? And I've never been aware as a high school principal retired in 2000 of people giving information. Maybe it was a bit too early. You hadn't progressed far enough with your research giving information out to grade 10 girls. But I wonder, are you going into the colleges now and giving little pamphlets to grade 11 and 12 girls? Uh, that They're emphasising in the schools, overemphasising, in my effect, well-being of the kids. And the kids are bored silly with most of the programs, but I'm convinced that they'd be fascinated to watch this and to learn something about it. Now, having said that before, I get your response, but I also suggest that I got to know uh, Luke Edmonds, who, the, the new member for Pembroke, who got elected a, a month or so ago in that seat. He's a former journalist and he's got the communication skills. And I suggest that I'll ring him up tomorrow, in fact, and I would suggest that you might like to contact Luke. And the new members always are looking for an issue to get a bit of publicity in the press. I'm not being derogatory saying that as part of the game. But could I recommend you contact Luke Edmonds, the member for Pembroke? But back, can you tell us what you're doing and what you'd recommend to get more information out on a these issues? Absolutely. And I, look, I agree with you totally that, you know, we need to do we need to do more. I, I can tell you a, a few things. So I belong to um, a ministerial thyroid advisory committee, which reports directly to the minister. Now our chair, Professor John Burgess, is working very hard um, with politicians, with the education department, with health to actually progress this. We have a new working group which has just been established. And we hope to look at all the recommendations that have come out of that report. So that's one thing that's happening. I am more than happy to talk to journalists about this and get, get the message out. This is why I come and do these sort of talks. And I'm really glad to have such a great turnout tonight. It is a matter of getting this information back out into the community. You know, things have moved on. People forget about goiter. We don't see people with this. What we what what exists now is fairly invisible and it's very subclinical. It's hard to actually measure these things. You know, it's, if you talk to um, my colleague, Professor Ian Hay, who's um, the past professor of the um, department, what was the Department of Education, <laughs> the Faculty of Education here at UTAS, he will tell you that you see kids with these learning difficulties. And he's actually written a fantastic paper showing that this gestational iodine deficiency that's occurring is impacting across a whole range of things. It's not necessarily manifesting as ADHD or the other things that we put labels on, but it's a more generalised difficulty with learning. And I could tell you, I'd probably bore you to death actually, with what we think is going on in the brain and what processes are not functioning. But it's to do, it's to do with auditory processing disorder and a, and a couple of other things. That's what we think is happening from a whole range of studies that have been done by other people. Now, it's interesting that you mention about um, getting into schools. That is something that Ian and I would love to do. We would love to have this as part of the health curriculum, especially for teenage girls. We know that teenage girls are the ones that are going to be on those fad diets. They're going to cut bread out because it's trendy to be gluten-free, even if you haven't got an issue with gluten. It's trendy to be lactose free, even if you're not lactose intolerant. These are issues that, you know, with more funding, we could look, in, look into them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, does, that, does that answer your question? We're trying to do as much as we can. <laughs> Another quick online question here, uh, and this is from Julie. Hi, Julie. Has the recognition of problems of excess salt led to iodine lack problems? 
Julie, you'll be really interested to know that when I first started working at the Menzies Institute, I actually shared an office um, with the salt guru. Um, oh, my gosh, his name just came in and out of my head. <laughs> yes, Trevor Beard, Professor Trevor Beard. So he was very much against salt because it causes a whole range of things. We know the issues with um, blood pressure and heart disease. We do want to cut salt out of our diet. But there is a way of rectifying this. You can just increase the level of iodine in the iodized salt. So even if you're reducing it, the less salt you have by increasing the level of iodized salt, we all have salt in our diet. It is in processed foods. But even if we start to cut it down in processed foods, we could increase the amount. And we do actually monitor how much is in the bread to make sure. And we might find that over time, we may need to increase that level slightly so that we're still remaining sufficient. But yes, that is a, that is a concern and particularly in Western countries, oh. yeah. Do we have any other questions from the, uh, maybe down the, we'll, we'll go to the front here after this next one at the back. Uh, hello, um, you would know that um... The illiteracy rate here in Tasmania is 47%, the same as Afghanistan. I just wondered if you could pin that on lack of iodine or perhaps just a shabby department of education. <laughs> well, given that I come from a family of teachers and I understand how hard teachers work, um, I believe the education department are doing a lot to try and deal with this. Iodine may be part of the answer. Certainly when we look at those literacy outcomes for NAPLAN, and it's not only NAPLAN, we've got other measures as well. There is a distinct difference between those groups. And that remains when we adjust for all of those um, factors that we know influence education, such as socioeconomic status, the education level of the mother and the father, things that might impact on the learning of a child. It doesn't change that outcome. Those associations are still there. So it may be part of the problem. I think it's certainly worth investigating. Great. I think we've got time for one and two, if we're quick, more questions. <laughs> I understand from what you've said today that it's quite critical for pregnant mothers to um, have an iodine supplement. But what if that's missed? Is it possible as growing children, as adults, to also have a supplement that may help or is it too late at that stage? It depends on what you're looking at. So the literacy outcomes that we looked at, we think that what's happening developmentally early in pregnancy is not able to be changed by having adequate iodine later in life. There are some things, and you, if you get into the um, literature, you'll find that there are some studies that say it doesn't make any difference, you know, if you're the mother's iodine deficient, but it depends what you're measuring. So there's a study that came out of New Zealand that looked at a whole range of cognitive outcomes and I, some IQ testing. Depending on which test you looked at, some things could be fixed by having iodine. So they did a trial over six weeks supplementing children and giving them the adequate amount of iodine and compared them to their, what they were measured on before they had that. And there were improvements in some measures. But these things with the literacy that we looked at, those domains did not improve. So yes and no is the answer to that question. I'll just get you to say that again in the microphone. I'm so sorry. So it could ha possibly have health benefits, but not necessarily literacy Look, benefits. If, if the child or the adult was iodine deficient, yep, definitely taking a supplement. But that shouldn't be necessary for most people in Tasmania now. But if you are eating bread and having dairy foods and occasional seafood on a regular basis, your iodine levels should be fine. And the testing that we do every five years in the schools where we measure it in children shows that things are fine. It's the pregnant women that we're worried about now. Yeah. We are running very quickly out of time, uh, but if you are in the live audience today, we can perhaps uh, come and ask Christmas some Absolutely. questions after we've um, finished the session. Uh, and
and uh, I'd like to all invite you, given the message that we've talked about today, to uh, jump online and uh, look at the rec lecture recording that you'll find on our, our Island of Ideas webpage and share it with your friends and, and those at-risk people that we've been talking about today. I think we have a duty to each other and to our community to try and uh, help, help, help solve this problem together. Um, so this evening's talk, as I said, will be available really shortly uh, on our webpage. And I'd really like to thank you for joining us tonight and bringing this important topic to the front of everyone's minds. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Kristen Hines. Our next event, the Sir Patrick Abercrombie Lecture, is say the 8th of December uh, with Peter Poulet, who's a town planner, talking about um, uh, the way we can solve this housing crisis and making some amazing recommendations from his uh, planning profession there. I really encourage you to uh, tune in to that one. Um, it's going to be an amazing talk. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been really special to have you all here. Uh, have a safe trip home. And for those of you who are joining us online, um, have, a, have, a, have a nice cup of tea and go to bed. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Take care.